Welcome again, saints. Let me pray for us. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we go, uh, Lord, just forward in this lesson, Lord, as we finish out this summer session, Father, I just thank you, Lord, for bringing, Lord, us thus far. Father, I just thank you for all the things that you've shown us, my Lord, and just the revelation, Lord, of your word uh, to our minds and to our spirits, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for those who show up, Lord, week after week, listening to a weak vessel like me, Father. I just, I, Lord, praise you. Uh, Lord, I just praise you that I can also just lead your people in this season, Lord. And Lord, I just uh, just praise you that whether that season lasts longer or don't, Lord, that I remain in your service, Lord, and that each person here, uh, Lord, remains in your service as well. But Lord, that you give each of them the courage to be who you and what you have called them to be, regardless of what uh, people around them in the churches, families, whoever it is, Lord, may be... Uh, Lord, trying to discourage them in that purpose because they don't understand. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, saints, today is August 14th, uh, 2022, a lesson 11, unit three, the great hope of the saints. And uh, we are, uh, the title of this lesson is No Place Like It. And the devotional reading is 2 Peter 3, 8 through 13. And the background scriptures, Revelation 21, 10 through 27. The print passage is Revelations 21, 10 through 21 and the key verse says the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the name of the 12 apostles of the lamb and what we're going to do saints is i'm going to dig into that because there's this pattern uh in the biblical narrative that i believe uh, that you should know about uh even before i get to the review part so when we talk about the city had 12 foundations in the name of the 12 apostles of the lamb uh we know that they uh, who jesus who this uh, texas is, is talking about but but i also wanted to introduce you to uh this this larger biblical concept and that this number 12 like keeps popping up throughout the scripture right and I, I didn't, and let me just be clear about this. I didn't learn this at like some seminary or something like that. It's just, if you read the text, this, uh, these patterns and these numbers like becomes, they become like super evident. So when we talk about 12, here's just like some basics of that. Uh, the, the uh, nation of the physical nation of Israel obviously was established through the son of the promise through Abraham and Sarah. And obviously his name was Isaac. Isaac had, uh, Isaac had, uh, Jacob and Jacob had 12 sons and the name of those 12 sons are obviously the foundation of the tribes of Israel that we know today but we also know that Abraham had another son his oldest son's name was Ishmael but he wasn't the son of a promise he had Ishmael through a uh, servant named uh, Hagar the Egyptian and out of him, God promised that there will be 12 princes as well. So out of his oldest son came 12 princes. Out of uh, out of Jacob, obviously, came the 12 tribes of Israel or the nation and the people of promise. But even when we push further into that and we, we jump over to the New Testament, what we find out is Jesus was intentional at selecting like how many disciples. It was 12, right? So when we push even into that, we realize the urgency of when Judas killed himself and when that discipleship turned into apostleships, that they cast lots and they chose in that through that they chose Matthias to be that 12th apostle to obviously replace Judas. So what I'm saying to you is when, when you see these 12 foundations, 12 gates and 12 apostles, 12 disciples, you know, 12 tribes, realize that it has something to do with establishing a foundation of something. And here's what's really going to mess you up. And it messed me up. So uh, when I uh, working on the uh, working towards anyway, next, next year starting, uh, well, at least putting in my PhD uh, proposal and, and it's going to just shake the all and it's going to be big. It ain't just going to be some mess that, you know, somebody paid the money and wrote 140 pages or whatever it is. And somebody gives you a PhD because if I do it, it has to be groundbreaking. That's just kind of where I'm at with, with that. I don't care anything about being called Dr. Dale, nothing like this. What I do has to resonate. I mean, it has to really change. It has to change what we know. And that's kind of where I'm at with this. And uh, what I am um, proposing there is not only is the biblical foundation 
not only is the biblical foundation like uh, establishing these things built on these these governments these 12 apostles and 12 disciples and 12 tribes 12 gates all these other things but it's also going to propose that god is even on a quantum level that there are 12 elements that actually establish the foundation for all god created yeah yeah it's big it's really big and it's so much bigger than even that so i just wanted to say that even before we did the review because i don't like i don't want you to miss those small they, they seem small but we kind of brush over them uh, and I'm not, I'm just kind of like that dude that's just going to skip on by that type of stuff. And August 7th, I'm just going to go back a week. And what we, no more, no more tears was that lesson. And if you remember, the key verse was, God shall wipe away all the tears from eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And what we learned from that is that's a time in the future uh, when when God is going to just recreate all of these things that uh, we as humans messed up, you know, that that song that Donald Lawrence uh, sings called Let's Get Back to Eden, Get on Top of the World. There's <laughs> there's more truth to that than, you know, <laughs> there's more truth to that than, you know, because a lot of times we think we think of God in our linear minds as, OK, God is going from A to B, Alpha, you know, or, or A Alpha to Omega beginning ending. So we're going to start in the garden and then we're going to end at Revelations 21, Revelations 22. So this linear line, when God doesn't operate like that at all, it's more of a circle, if you will. God is going to loop this thing back and, and set right what once went wrong, if you will. So we, we learned it's going to wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, neither sorrow, no crying, neither shall be any more pain for the former things are passed away. And what I told you at that time, uh, saints of God is that this recreative process actually begins long before this. And I say that because the Bible also tells us, behold, when anyone is in Christ, uh, behold, it says all old things have passed away and all things become new. So that creative process actually begins with us just with the basic knowledge uh, of God being born again, you know, uh, spirit and born of spirit, born of the water, obviously born of the uh, uh, covering of the blood of Jesus. And I also told you long time ago, that this thing isn't necessarily even about the blood of Jesus is about the life in Jesus's blood, his sinless life represented in the blood. You see, and this is this is why Jesus uh, is worthy in the book of Revelation. He's the only one uh, in the biblical narrative worthy to even touch the book, according to the Apostle John earlier in this book of Revelations. Right. Because he is sinless. John said John's testimony was that earlier in this book was that. And he looked and I wept much because no one was found worthy to even even look on it but uh, obviously the lamb of god is so he's going to wipe away all that pain saints and he's going to wipe away those tears and the former things are going to be passed away and all things again are going to be become new and i am just so looking forward uh to that time of of no pain and and sick and no sickness and and all of these other uh things and the lesson aims and that one of the lesson aims uh deserves certainly mentioning uh, as well is is to contemplate the creation of a new heaven and new earth for the hope of the vision holds for the faithful and what we found out is there's a new heaven new earth and new jerusalem and what i discussed with you was saints that new heaven new earth and a new jerusalem had to be created because sin touched all of those places remember i told you about uh the ezekiel 28 narrative as well as the isaiah uh yeah isaiah chapter 14 narrative of lucifer ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 spell out uh, who Lucifer is, how he fell. When you package those two things together, we next see Lucifer as a serpent uh, in the Garden of Eden. And then he commits this sin by lying to Adam and Eve. So that's like the first sin uh, in spatial time was that committed by the serpent. And then Adam and Eve sin based on the lie that was told them so they actually like was the second sin but they were the first human sin judge i want to be fair with that but we're i have to be as precise as possible right 
uh, because of this concept of original sin. There's a lot of misunderstanding around that. But nevertheless, uh, I wanted to say that because sin permeated eternity when Lucifer and Isaiah 14 said in his heart, I will ascend to the most high. I will be like God. I will sit on the mountains of the north. He was cast down. He was judged. He was cast down. Find him in the garden. Again, he was judged for he was the first being in spatial time. Judge was that serpent as well. God judged the serpent. He judged Eve and Adam. And that was the order of that sin in Genesis chapter three. The serpent sinned first. He lied. Lying is sin. Eve sinned second. She gave fruit to her husband. He did eat. And God judged the serpent first. On your belly shall you crawl and eat dust all days of your life. Eve, your will will be to the will of your husband. And Adam, uh, the judgment on Adam about uh, the ground not bringing forth its strength, etc., etc. So that happened in heaven. And then sin entered into spatial time through Adam and Eve, right? Because they were judged and they were the first human sins judged. So sin entered as well earth and then obviously it entered into jerusalem so those that's why there has to be a new heaven new earth new jerusalem and that's why it has to be a new us as well right because god is not going to be able to look on that sort of sin and then we push forward as well uh what we and and what we talked about was uh what do you think one of the what the last what do you think says how did the fates of overcomers and believers challenge the community of faith to refocus and prior prior to uh, reprioritize ministry and at that time i also said to you a lot of time is spent in ministry activity but it's not actually productive and what we mean by that is a lot of times we get we do busy work and that busy work is just unproductive i mean it's not it's self-glorification and, and self-aggrandizement is what it is, or we're puffing ourselves up, feeling like we're doing something. You know, I worked at a homeless shelter. I was the executive director of a homeless shelter for a lot of years. And uh, one thing I knew, uh, one, one thing I knew is that there were people that showed up a lot of times and they, they really believed that they were doing the work of the Lord, but they just showed up uh, because that like they'd heard a sermon challenging their faith and they showed up to feel good about walking out their faith and they weren't really there necessarily to serve. But I think at the same time, we have to understand that in the church as well. We would we would do much more good in the world, praying and fasting and reading and studying God's word rather than all this ministry activity we do. For instance, uh, you know, some unproductive ministry activity can be like all these church programs. You know, one of the blessings and, and so many people died. And I, I want to be kind of be careful with that during this covid time and the, the pandemic was the, this covid uh, thing. Uh, one of the things that it forced us to realize, uh, and, and I'm a, a church leader in this season anyway, um, but one thing it forced us to realize was that all that ministry, all these running around to these dead programs is really like not worth continuing. And uh, the only people that's really continuing that kind of stuff is like, I mean, on a continuous basis. I mean, he's that church anniversary and then the pastor anniversary, that kind of stuff. That's you know, cool. And uh, there's some other things going on, but I, I think at the same time, it forced all of us to, to realize what's really important and what's not right. And we, I, I can't even remember the last time that we, uh, as a church have been out to like one of them, like programs. Now there are certain people who, if they request, I'm going to show up for the, the remnant, the, the real people of the, the real leaders of God in this city, you know, 20, some African-American churches, there's about eight or nine real hardcore uh, church leaders that are sold out for them. I'm going to show up for them. But this program and stuff, that's an example of ministry activity that's not serving any any purpose. And if you really want to know what those men, those pro, most of those programs are about, it's it's fundraising. It's money. That's what it's about. And I know that you might, as many of you may not know that, but I was in the back rooms with these preachers that are putting on these programs. And I, when I first began pastoring, I did that myself. I thought that's like what you should do. I thought that was how things go. And it was right until, you know, some years later, I'm, I'm seeing the seedy underbelly that this is about here. Anyway, you go, you give them a hundred dollars. They come, they give you a hundred dollars. You know, this, this, just all of this stuff that has nothing to do with Jesus as minute as we are, it's ministry activity, but it really has nothing to do with the kingdom. That is not saying now, now y'all know, I ain't trying to qualify or soften the blow. I don't do that. Take it how you will. Chew it, eat it, spit it back up, whatever you want to do. I don't apologize. Y'all can get out my face with that. But I will say this is there are times, of, although they be few and far between, that the saints of God get together and we have uh, really a, a really a, a foot stomping time in the Lord. But those things are so few and far between, man. I can count them, man, on my hands for the last years I've been here pastoring, right? Because, again, 
we do things that ain't got nothing to do with the Lord. Now, we still have some underlines in this city as well. Some people still sending that stuff out trying to get money. And we ain't sending no money and we ain't going unless it's the real people of God. That's just how it is. So, again, back to August 14th, uh, the great uh, hope and, and these things. And the key verse, the wall of the city had 12 foundations and then the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the lesson names as a result of experiencing this lesson. You should be able to do these things. Explore the possibility of living in a new place, even in another dimension of life. That is powerful, man. That That is powerful. That is the most powerful lesson name I've seen in this series. That is powerful, brother. Imagine the richness and serenity of living in the new Jerusalem and celebrate God's provision of a new city for believers throughout eternity. And the introduction says American of all ages are familiar with the classic movie, The Wizard of Oz. Dorothy, the principal character, decides to run away from home to protect her pet dog. Upon leaving, she's caught in a major storm that leaves her in an unconscious state of mind in which she envisions being transported to an extraordinary world of fantasy. The plot focuses, revolves around her attempts to get back home to her aunt, uncle, and friends. When that, opportun when that opportunity arrives, she's told that all she needs to do is click her heels three times and repeat, there's no place like home, and the expected resolution occurs. So, <laughs> I saw that as a kid, but... Uh, in 1982 at the Waterloo Public Library in Waterloo, Iowa, I was going through a catalog and I seen uh, uh, a disc that they had and it was called The Wiz. <laughs> and I watched that movie. I watched that movie so many times down at the library over the next two years that the, the disc was ruined. I mean, it was skipping this dog kind of stuff. But that's my favorite, The Wiz. How that movie, The Wiz, never won an Academy Award of any kind is amazing in this day and time because that movie is still great today and that's my thing was uh the wiz y'all remember um uh, dorth uh diana ross now some of y'all knew diana ross from the supremes i didn't know that diana ross i knew the diana ross that sung with lionel richie uh in 1982 1983 so i said all that to point that out is that that we had a version of the Wiz to uh, the Wizard of Oz. It was called the Wiz, and I liked it more. Now, it's, it's continuing here. It says, we are in this world, but not at home yet. Our real home is in heaven. We are commanded to refuse to love this world because it is and desires are temporary and fleeting. God has prepared a new city, a new home for all who are his children through faith in Jesus Christ. According to the Apostle John's descriptive vision, there is no place like his beauty, character, security, and permanency. We look forward to uh, daily returning to our earthly homes, uh, but our deepest longing should be to arrive and spend eternity in the presence of God. And the analysis of the biblical text, a place of eternal beauty, Revelations 21, 10 through 14. And then IB says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and his brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and a 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. I told you this, I hadn't read this before. There are three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the description says the angel invited John to view the city and transported him to a high mountain. John's experience was spiritual. That is, he was not physically carried to this mountain, but he saw it in a vision. When John penned revelations, he was an exiled prisoner on Patmos Isle in the Aegean Sea. Through a spiritual vision, John says that the angel showed him the holy city of Jerusalem and repeats this initial observation of its origins. To John, the city's most striking characteristic was its appearance. John observes that is filled with the radiant light of God's glory, the totality of his extraordinary attributes. John said that the effect of God's radiating glory was like the brilliance of a rare expensive gem. And Jasper, and y'all remember when Moses came down from the mount, they had to put a veil on him because he was in that presence. And you know, he shone uh, like really brightly and the countenance of God was on him. So this is a brilliance uh, that we can't even imagine. And remember that in our current sinful states, the Bible also indicates that uh, God himself said no one can look on, on him and live, especially and not in his sin flesh. But we know that Adam and Eve were able to do that. They were able to look on him pre-fall uh, anyway. So with that, too, we realized that God, that there was this, this great request from Moses. And, and one of my favorite top three prayers in the entire Bible was Moses's request anyway to God. Uh, Lord, show me your glory. And God hit him in the cleft of the rock, covered his eyes, passed by. The Bible says Moses saw his hind parts because it's so radiant, so brilliant uh, that in our sinful state, we just can't look on it. It's offensive 
to uh, this sinful flesh that we live in? What do you think? What are the challenges in balancing the hope of spending eternity with God and living holy lives? Now, the challenge is in this flesh. And Paul stated it so eloquently, uh, saints, when, when he talked about this challenge. And what Paul was talking about there is he was just putting forth this case that the very things that his spirit knows he should do, his flesh is keeping him from doing. And the very things that his flesh wants to do, his spirit is letting him know you shouldn't do. And he went on to say the very things that I should not do, those things do I. And the very things that I should do, those do I not. And he went on to say, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of death? So that was the challenge in balancing the hope of spending eternity with God and uh, living holy lives now because we understand uh, saints that uh, true is the saying, no cross, no crown. And that this same book talks about he who uh, endures to the death, uh, he's going to get the crown of life. So when we talk about living holy lives now, we need to be totally focused on that. Now, let's bring back in that earlier statement I made with respect to ministry and doing ministry and how oftentimes ministry activity is contrary to building the kingdom of God. A lot of things we do, we have, we, we do because we think it's pleasing God and it's actually leading us to a place of sin. I gave you an example of that uh, one of a great example some months ago when I was speaking about uh, leadership and that le those lessons were on leadership and how to lead from a holy perspective and how your free will is often violated, right? Because people are twi church leaders twisting your arms, trying to force you to do things. And you think that those things are pleased. Oh, if I'm just obedient to the man of God and the woman of God, God is going to be pleased. No, he's not. God's not going to be pleased you doing anything that is against your will. The Bible talks about, you know, we, when I was growing up, uh, and uh, give not grudgingly or necessity for the Lord loves the true forgiver. It wasn't just talking about money. It was talking about service. And the scripture also further commands us to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, and blameless. And it's saying, I'm not going to drag you there, God's saying, but you need to present yourself. And what that says is willingly. So we got two things. Give not grudgingly, nor of necessity of your service, time, talent, whatever that is. And then present yourself. So what this is speaking of is a free will offering of yourself and everything that you think you have, because it all belongs to God anyway. So saints, God is not pleased with you doing anything. You can't be always obedient to the man of God or the woman of God and obedient to God at the same time, because if God never commands us to violate your free will, here's like a petty example but it kind of makes me sick to my stomach every time I see it is when uh, some people, they get up, these church leaders, they get up and they take up these offerings and they'll go count it out. And if it's not enough, they'll come and browbeat people for more. And it got into a place where people just keep back money because they know these, you know, these crooks are going to browbeat them and violate scripture, violate people's free will, violate uh, what God told them to do and what not to do. Right. And it gets so bad that people start being like, dang, I'm just going to hold some back because I know this, I, I know this, you know, money grubbing preacher is going to take up three or four offerings. I mean, this stuff happens. And I'm telling you, the people of God, if you are doing anything that's against your free will, God is not pleased with it. That includes ministry activity as well. That's why I said the best thing that most of us can do 90% of the time is pray, seek the face of God, and then allow him to guide us into what ministry activities we can give from a free will offering. For instance, I also told you about the time that I was like a youth pastor, you know, I was almost 20 years ago now. You know, pastor, you need a youth pastor. You wanted me? I did it, but it was the wrong thing. I scared me. I scared them kids to death, man. Can y'all imagine me? You know, as aggressive and confrontational and then stomping people's guts out with the work. Can you imagine me trying to lead some babies? I was scared them babies half to death. I repent of that because I was doing ministry activity, but it wasn't of God. And I did it unwillingly, so it wasn't of God anyway. And I'd say unwillingly because it, I, I, I felt like I shouldn't be doing it, but I was trying to be obedient to the man of God. So I'm saying to you, saying to you, you got to make a choice. You got to be obedient to the man of God or you got to be obedient to God. And in a perfect world, those things are mutually inclusive, but they aren't always. 
and I, I told you a story lastly before I go on about a, a dear sister uh, from our church, Sister Patricia Gary. I mean, you know, I, I was like, Sister Gary, I need you to do this. You know, I'm, I'm first time past. I'm on fire. So guess all right, Pat, I'm going to do it, you know. And then finally, you know, I know she talked to the Lord because by the time she came to me, she just had such peace with it, right? And she just said, Pastor, I ain't going to do this. And this is who I am and this is why I'm not. And I was like, wow, I've been convicted ever since that time. Because again, she was trying to be obedient to the man of God, but she got to a place of disobedience. God, Sister Gary knows who she is. Her husband, Brother Willoff and Gary, natural leader, he knows who he is, right? And we as leaders can't take people out of those places. And I'm telling you, uh, uh, saints of God, don't let somebody force you into a place of disobedience because you think you're being obedient. Plenty of room. Revelations 21, 15 through 17. Ooh, I hope Sister Gary and Brother Gary don't mind me calling the name out here. <laughs> but those are saints of God right there. You better not say nothing bad about them Garys to me. You better not say nothing bad to them. Bad about them to me. You better not say that about them. And plenty of good room. Revelations 21, 15 through 17. And, and 15 says, and he talked. And he that talked with me had golden rod to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the cities lie four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth of the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits. And according to the measure of a man. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to go back through here and I want to show you how these numbers flow throughout the text just off the top of my spirit here saints before we go to the what do you think and he that walked with me had to go to measure that's verse 15 revelations 21 15 and it says a city is twelve thousand furlongs where have you heard that number twelve thousand before well i'll tell you where you've heard it you've heard it earlier in revelation when it was talking about that the hundred forty four thousand that would be sent out to preach the gospel to the world in times twelve thousand from each of the 12 tribes of Jacob, which is 144,000. And then it says, and verse 17 says, and the measure of the wall there of 144, 144 cubits. 144, where have you heard that before? 144,000. In earlier in the book of Revelation. So all I'm saying, saints, here is, man, God is remarkably consistent. Even when we deal with the number 12, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 princes coming out of Ishmael, 12 disciples, 12 apostles. And then even when you do a multiple of that number, 24 elders sitting on the throne. I mean, this thing gets big. So when, when you see this, especially in these revelatory numbers, saints, I don't want you to miss that. What do you think? How should the knowledge of New Jerusalem spaciousness inform efforts to evangelize the lost? Because we want to be so evangelistic. And, and that's again, again, that's a gifting as well. Right. But outreach is everybody's deal. It doesn't matter if you cooking food for somebody to give to the poor. It doesn't matter if you're praying for somebody, witnessing somebody, knocking on doors, street preaching, uh, uh, making hot dogs and hamburgers and dropping the gospel on people. <laughs> Impact Nation, you know who you are. <laughs> My dear friend, uh, Pastor Marshandis, doctor, let me get myself together. Marshandis Robinson, and he did the work. He ain't around here calling himself a, a, a doctor like them fake preachers who call themselves doctors and ain't never done the work. Y'all need to y'all need to confront them about that, y'all. That's sin. And I'm going to say this, and I said in the last lesson, and I'm going to say it again. Nobody who hasn't done the Ph.D. work should be calling themselves doctors because they passed it for seven years. That is lying about who you are and what God said about you at this point in your life. We preach against men who call themselves women and me, uh, women who call themselves men. We preach against that because they are lying about who God made them to be. They are saying something that God didn't say about them. So how is that any different than a preacher saying that they are a doctor, they haven't done the work, they have no intentions on doing the work, yet they're saying and, and stealing something that doesn't belong to them and saying something different than God said about them at this season in their life. It's theft. And it's lying on resumes. If somebody came to y'all church and lied on their resume, what would y'all do? If a preacher came and lied, what would y'all do? Y'all be like, oh, he lied on his resumes. He's disqualified. But yet you got somebody in a pulpit saying they're a doctor. And you got other people that paid thirty, forty thousand dollars done done all of this monstrous work and earned that and it is, is duly recognized by their peers. I'll uh, that that are being made equal to these people, uh, these people that's just calling themselves doctors, saints. No lie is of the truth, and you can't lie and say that you're something that you're not. If I came to you and I told you again, like I said last week, that I was a surgeon, 
uh, but I ain't never went to college and I certainly never performed surgery, but I just feel like I want to call myself a heart surgeon. You would say, what? You lying, Dale. You ain't operating on me. Why are you letting these same people operate on you in the spirit, trying to tell you the truth of who you are and they're lying about who they are? We got to do better than this, man. And for you preachers and pastors that are doing this, y'all need to repent. What God said about you in this season in your life is enough. And I don't have a PhD. So I'm not here trying to defend, you know, defend the castle. I don't got a dog in that fight. But that's just, that's just not true. And y'all need to stop that. The incomparable beauty as we finish. Revelation 21, 18 through 21. And the NIV says, The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold is pure glass. The foundation of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. You can also see a vision of the garden of God called Eden as well in Ezekiel 28. You, you'll find that very interesting when you compare this. Uh, Ezekiel 28 about the description and this, you will find that very interesting, saints. Just letting you know. The fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, and the seventh crystal light, the eighth pearl, and the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amulet. Isn't that something? Twelve, uh, twelve jewel. Isn't that something? Yeah. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, and each made of a single pearl. The great sheet of city was gold as transparent glass. And what do you think as we finish? What attributes of God are identifiable? identifiable in his preparation of the home of the saints his magnificent gloriousness is his just his sure beauty and jesus said i go to prepare a place for you and he jesus said if i he told his disciples if i go to prepare a place for you i will come and receive you again unto myself for where i am you may be also the bible also talks about uh, and this is multi-layered. This isn't just like the city, but eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of us. Well, God has prepared those, prepared for those that love him. Father God, in the name of Jesus, just thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for this lesson, Lord. Just thank you, Lord. Uh, Lord, and I just pray, Lord, for those that uh, right now, Lord, just are, are saying stuff about themselves that you didn't say and lying. Lord, that, Lord, all of us, Lord, get this deception out of our lives. Supposing that what you said about us at these seasons in our lives are not enough. But yet we preach against people that say lies about themselves like homosexuals and these types of people. Lord, we're hypocrites. Lord, are oftentimes hypocrites. But Lord, we know, Lord, that you are God and you are God by yourself. And Lord, we come to you right now in the matchless name of Jesus. Lifting that up to you, Lord, I pray. Uh, Lord, also for the hearers, Lord, here on YouTube, Lord, our Lord, those 2,400 students, Lord, that this lesson will get to each of them, Lord, and on terrestrial radio or on social media, wherever this might stand. Lord, the KBBG, uh, Waterloo, Iowa radio listeners as well, Lord, that this lesson, Lord, may bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. And so be it. Hey, just a quick break in this video to tell you to go to sermondownloads.net. The link is in the description section of this video. Download six different sermon packages or pass these on as a gift to Bible study teachers, preachers, pastors, deacons, whoever it is. We buy books. We buy devotionals, right? We buy all of this Christian literature, Sunday school lesson books. I'm asking you to take the next step and support sermondownloads.net. They're down in the description section of this video. Click on the link. So be it.